Patrick, many of us interact with a green core product at some point during the day, but for any of us that don't go to the trouble of reading the label on the back, can you tell us what green core is and what it does? We make loads of food for the UK population. So about half or 30 million people in the UK consume one of our products every week and 90% of the UK population consume one of our products every month. The most common products are pre-prepared sandwiches. So we make about six in 10 of all of the pre-prepared sandwiches that are uh, sold in the UK every year. That's about 750 to 800 million individual um, packs of sandwiches every year. But in addition to that, we also make sushi, salads, ready meals, soup, sauces, pickles, Yorkshire puddings. So a wide range of products, but mainly for people's immediate consumption needs. So if you're going out for your lunch, if you're looking to, uh, to pick up a snack during the day, we make chilled fresh product for those occasions for UK consumers. Now, I want to touch on the US market briefly yeah. because I think it's important to have that historical yeah. context to understand green core in the present day. So you spent a decade kind of readying yourself for the US market. Um, acquired Peacock Foods and then you lost a potentially lucrative contract to supply Starbucks as well over there. Did this knock the wind out of your sails a little bit and show you that, hey, you know, there's a lot to be prepared for in the US market? I mean, ultimately, we built a very successful business in America. I mean, we sold it for a very significant premium to, to all of the capital that we invested there. But there were lessons along the way, and the, the exit from America represents a very big change in our strategy and it had very big implications for me. I mean, last year alone, I did 26 return trips to the States in, in 2018. If I think about the evolution of Green Corps in the 12 years that I've been CEO, the business that I became CEO of was still principally an Irish sugar business. Right? We were the monopoly processor of sugar in Ireland. We had a whole series of products that we sold uh, to Irish farmers, a whole series of, of agri products that we purchased, malt, grain, flour, um, out of that. And so you know, the change from that to a growing UK convenience food business, which then we then added a very dramatically scaled up US business through that time. And, and what simply happened was this time last year, we got a a compelling offer uh, from a strategic buyer to take all of our US business at a, at a very significant premium to what we paid for it. And as a public company, we felt it was our job to take that price. And you got back what you invested in the US operation and yeah. had some yeah. spare change yeah. out of it as well. In very rough terms, we spent $750 million buying Peacock Foods at the end of 2016. We had invested about $200 million in other capital in the previous nine years and we got $1.1 billion of proceeds for the whole lot. So we cleared over $100 million after investment profit for, um, for the time in America. So you came back with this pot, and yeah. what, what have you done with it? We, we gave about half of it back to shareholders um, by, a, by buying back 500 million pounds worth of our shares. Um, we reduced our debt by 300 million pounds, um, and that's given us more, less debt, less indebtedness, and more capacity to invest behind growing our business in the UK in the years ahead. That's a good point. Would you say that in terms of the ratio of debt to equity, where, where would you say you, you're, you are? The key way we look at it is actually what is the, um, what's the ratio of debt to the earnings of our business. And it was between two and two and a half times, and it's now one and a half times. So we've gone from having 500 million of debt to 250 million in debt um, in the period. And that just gives us a stronger balance sheet and more investment capacity for the future. And I guess this, this has kind of fueled the ambition that you have yeah. now. Um, so I, I know food to go is a huge ambition for you and you expect it to be a seven billion pounds category by 2024. That, that's you know, a short space of time for that. So I'd be interested to know what, what are you setting that projection on? The most observers of the UK food market really like the food to go space because it's dynamic, it's fast growing, it plays to all of the, the different channels that consumers are using to source their product. And it's mostly populated with very interesting and healthy fresh food. We think, and as do kind of most of the kind of industry authorities, that it will probably grow by four or five percent a year going forward in the context of food overall only growing at one and a half to two percent. So it's going to grow at something like twice the rate of, of food overall. And what we're trying to do as a business in the next five to ten years is to move from being a business that was very focused on capturing that opportunity with just the sandwich 
to having a series of other products in addition to sandwiches. So um, sushi, uh, meal salads, chill snacks, hot food, um, and to sell them through a wider range of outlets or points of distribution than before. So it, it's really about broadening our products and broadening our channels in the context of the overall market growing strongly. What do you think is driving it? Is it people being more health conscious? Is it people thinking about the planet? Do you think we are actually at a point where someone is thinking about the environment and their health versus the cost now? I would say yes to all of that, but the important point is it's been driven by consumers. Consumers who are snacking more regularly through the day or if I, um, there's the traditional meal occasions that we would have grown up with of breakfast, lunch, dinner is widening out into many, many more points of consumption through the day or evening. Health has always been a big theme in food, but it's manifesting itself more in new and interesting fresh products. So lots of plant-based products, lots of vegan alternatives, um, a you know ethnic uh, food inspired from around the world, like the strong growth of sushi, for example. So. You know, what we're seeing in, in very rough terms is a consumers who were very satisfied with a traditional British sandwich, um, typically at lunchtime, now moving to lots of different types of food at lots of different parts of the day. Um, but the common trend being health, freshness, and an increasing concern about the impact that those products have on the environment, be that in terms of where they're sourced from, what the nature of the ingredients are, what the nature of the packaging is, how they think about waste as consumers and how they think about waste um, in terms of the outlets in which they source the product. So all of those things matter. It's a difficulty facing anyone that's yeah. working within the food supply chain. Yeah. You know, if you did a straw poll of someone yeah. doing their, their food shop, they would be giving out about the plastic and the packaging on their vegetables and on their sandwiches and on their sushi. Yeah. But then if they were going through a box and they saw a, you know, a, a tub of rotten tomatoes or they took it home and, and you know, they lasted a day, they'd also be giving out. So we talked about the interesting anecdote that the film on a cucumber keeps it fresher for about eight to 14 days. How are you facing that, that challenge as someone that's trying to kind of square that circle of being, you know, kind and thoughtful about the environment but also giving customers what they want because if you're giving them food that isn't fresh they're going to go to somewhere else. Two years ago I could have made a balanced argument about the role of plastic in the UK food and the global food industry because the film that you described on cucumber or the packaging solutions that um, is used in a lot of product has done a very very good job of extending the life of either individual um, produce items or pre-prepared food in different ways. Um, I, I think we've moved on from that argument and uh, where consumers are is that plastic is just a problem, full stop. Um, and so what, what we need is to find different ways of assembling food, different ways of packaging food that can still deliver outcomes in terms of the shelf life of products, the shelf life of ingredients, but are manifestly better for the environment than some of the um, you know, the more high-profile use of plastic and packaging. And so, that, so that's what we're on with this. What, what it means for us is that um, we've made a pronounced shift in the amount of our ingredients that we source locally. Um, so in, in beef, for example, uh, four years ago, 80% of all of our beef came from outside the UK. Now only 20% of our beef comes from outside the UK. Same with our dairy ingredients, same in, um, uh, same in poultry. What it means in packaging is that we are moving more towards um, reusable, uh, compostable, um, and recycled packaging. Um, and the whole industry is doing it, but we, you know, particularly in relation to uh, sandwich and salad items, we, we've got to take a lead on that and we're doing it with our customers. I guess it really lies with innovation and that's what you learn at business school and on the job, you know, when you're working in a company. Our business has a particular feature that enables us to do a lot of that, right, which is because almost all of our ingredients are fresh, we make the products to order, we don't make them to stock. And so that means we can change what we make and how we make it very, very quickly. We make about two and a half thousand individual products every year, of which almost half are either brand new or substantially reformulated in any given year. And part of that is consumer tastes are changing, but part of it plays to experimentation around packaging and sustainability um, or the uh, changing in, uh, you know, ingredients more local rather than international, that sort of thing. So we're, we're able to make those changes quickly because we're not sitting on months worth of stock and we're not sitting on a big 
consumer communication around a particular, around the marketing of an individual SKU because they're all sold under our customer brands. So those two features mean we can be very responsive. If you are innovating and, and wanting to create all these different salads and ingredients, you know, you're going to need your avocados and your pomegranate seeds that you're not necessarily going to get up in Lincolnshire or in Scotland. Take us through your supply chain process and, and where you're getting your ingredients now and where you're going to need to be able to get your ingredients friction free as well. We still source most of our ingredients within the UK, right? So 80% of all of the raw material and packaging that goes into our products is sourced from the UK. Now some of those have components that have come um, internationally. A lot more of the ingredients than you might think are actually sourced in the UK and we've made conscious efforts to encourage that. So we have sponsored what's called hydroponic growing of certain types of produce where it was actually motivated principally by way of trying to reduce the presence of insects in lettuce and rocket and wild spinach and things like that and so we're, we're, we're actually growing it uh, using much more water rather than soil and that has positive consequences in terms of the quality of the product. Um, there are some things though that we that consumers love to get that you can't get in the UK. In terms of protein, Green Core buys a quarter of the world's supply of cold water prawns. Now they come from Greenland, Iceland, and the east coast of Canada. So Britain is unique actually in that um, in most of the rest of the world, people like prawns to be big and they call them shrimp. In, um, in the UK, the origins of the prawn cocktail are that they prefer them to be small and tasty. And so they're grown and farmed in cold waters rather than warm. Um, and that's why that's how they end up being smaller. But like that's a product that you have to source into um, internationally, same with um, you know, same with lamb, same with um, parts of pork, um, and of course, fresh seasonal items like fruit, vegetables, particularly in the winter, where uh, the UK would be a significant deficit market. Now, we're operating on limited information with Brexit at the yeah. moment. You said in 2013 that it is vital that the UK remains in the European Union, but you also said that it's having a conversation with itself that I think, in fairness, a lot of people in Ireland and Europe might not necessarily have been aware of. How do you feel? The people have spoken, right? Um, Britain voted to leave. Um, and uh, so I'm a Democrat and I'm respectful of that. I don't think it's good for the UK economy, um, but I think we can manage most of the big potentially negative consequences. So what we're doing as a business is prioritizing staying in supply with the ingredients that we need, um, in particular in the event of there being a no-deal Brexit. Um, and so, um, you know, we think there will be some challenges there, but we think they'll be manageable. Um, and we're highly confident, actually, that we will keep product on shelf uh, for consumers through what we do on recipes, what we do on sourcing, and how we work our supply chains with customers, and that's what we're focused on now. Looking more broadly at the relationship between the UK and Ireland, yep. Green Core is rooted in Ireland yep. and our Irish heritage. Yep and it's listed and it serves yeah. the UK market. Yeah. Talk me through the importance of the UK and Ireland when it comes to being trade partners and also just partners you know, in general and, and the, the fact that relations between the UK and Ireland have to be maintained. I was born in 1970, right? So I've seen the relationship with Ireland evolve. I have an, I have an English mother and an English wife. I am steeped in the British-Irish uh, uh, relationship. And the direction of travel, particularly for the last 20 years, has been unambiguously positive in terms of the trade relationship, political relationship, social relationship between Britain and Ireland. Uh, Brexit has created some challenges around that, but I'm confident that the respective countries can work that through. Um, as it relates to the food industry, it's an incredibly symbiotic relationship between, between Britain and Ireland. Um, the, as it happens, Ireland exports about a billion pounds a week of food into the UK, but also the UK exports about a billion pounds of food back into Ireland as well. So it's a, it's a very strong two-way flow. Many of the UK's biggest food companies, like Greencore, like Kerry Foods, like ABP, like Dawn Meats, like Keelings, um, are rooted in Ireland and have a very strong British-Irish relationship. Many of the leaders in UK retail 
uh, come from Ireland, and vice versa. You know, Tesco is a huge, um, uh, you know, the uh, biggest retailer in Ireland. Um, you know, you see it in convenience stores, food service. So the markets are absolutely entwined. They work to common uh, food standards, uh, common educational standards. Um, and actually the outcomes that are delivered for consumers in Britain and Ireland because of that relationship in terms of food pricing, food quality, food innovation are fantastic. Um, so it's, it is a real success story of what Britain and Ireland have done together um, and we need to keep it that way. I guess it has been ever thus, so... It hasn't been ever thus. It has, um, we've had 20 years of spectacular progress. It was reasonably good 20 and 30 years ago. It's much, much better now. Um, and I think it's in, in the interest of everybody to ensure that it, it continues on a good trajectory. Now, you want to feed the nation 24-7. That's part of your big growth plans. I'm thinking of companies like Uber and Deliveroo that are cropping up everywhere. So, you know, you're on the bus home and you can order your dinner and it's there waiting for you on a bike when you get home instead of getting out in the rain going in and getting a green core sandwich and bringing it home. How are you managing the, the, the competitors coming into the market? We're going to grow our business with two principles in balance, right? One is we want to be where consumers are in terms of how, where and when they're accessing product. But we also want to do it through the brands of our business partners rather than our own consumer brand, right? So at the moment, most of that is done through the brands of UK grocers, whether that be in large stores or small or online or uh, wholesaled or delivered in, in, in lots of different ways. We've expanded our customer repertoire reflecting how um, uh, the different ways in which consumers are, are buying product, be that vending or in-store coffee shops and, and so forth. So with everyone you mentioned, we're in discussions around being in supply um, and that's how it should be you know if, if we can have great available product um, and it fits against the brands that consumers trust to source that product uh, then we're we're really happy to do that and, and and that's how we'll go forward and you know certainly if you look at um, how in particular younger millennium consumers are ordering and eating food, it's very different from how their parents did it. You know, much more of it is ordered, it's much more fragmented, it's much more actually a fusion of food service and retail. And that's where we need to put Greencore, right in the, um, uh, to be really relevant to those occasions. And that's, that's what our strategy is. We've talked a lot about the business risks and opportunities and geopolitical and trade risks and opportunities. How do you keep going? What, what keeps you excited about the job that you have yeah. at hand? Is it all of these constantly changing things, really? I think there are a couple of kind of mindsets that are necessary to keep doing a job like this for a long time. The first is, I, I start with the point of view that it's an absolute privilege to have it. As a rule of thumb, any time you ever hear anyone giving out about how difficult their job is, they're not going to be in it for very much longer, right? So it is, you, you have to start with um, being grateful for and embracing the opportunity and responsibility that comes with it. Secondly, you've got to enjoy it. Um, and you know, I think the job, for all of its opportunities and challenges, kind of sits fairly lightly on my shoulders. The vast majority of the time, I actually love doing it, and, that, and that's important. And then the, the third bit I would say is that you, you have to embrace, see the opportunity in the change or in the challenges, right? So we touched on on Brexit earlier, right? If, if I look at um, some of the big challenges that have either been company specific or market features over the course of the last 12 years, you know, the financial uh, collapse and the impact that had on consumer behavior, the crisis of trust and transparency associated with horse meat in 2013, um, or more recently, the reset of our business post the exit from America. We've lent in to those and said, there's gonna be lots of opportunity here. And we've made the business better each time. And I think if you, if you come at it that way, you know, you're not naive or not recognizing that there sometimes are problems that just straight up have to be fixed. But most of the time, that uncertainty or that change creates business opportunities that if you get after it, you can make positive changes in the health of the business over time much more dramatically than you can in steady state and um, so that's probably how I think about it. You're the eldest in your family. Yeah. Did that set you up in any way to, to kind of to lead from from day one? Were you always sort of 
having to be the, the brave one in the pack at all. It's hard to know because, of course, you never know what it would be like if you weren't. I'm the eldest, my wife is the eldest, and so our eldest child doesn't know anything else than what it means to be an eldest child because of her parents. You know, I came from a big family, seven kids, um, six boys and a girl, um, very close in age. Uh, we were very close as a family, still are actually. And with that came, um, you know, a great sense of solidarity, but, you know, great opportunity too. You know, I had fantastic educational opportunities, work opportunities, and so. I have, I've embraced that positively, but I'm not the only member of my family who has embraced leadership opportunities in different ways. And so maybe some of it comes from being the eldest, but I think it comes from the whole environment um, around my family as much as necessarily being the eldest. Looking at the future for food and careers in food, and the days are definitely gone of a career in farming being on the farm for sure they're now in the labs they're in the classrooms they're in kitchens and in food innovation do you think that food and agribusiness needs to be put up the the scale in terms of the opportunities that it offers and for it to be to carry as much weight as a job in law or finance or technology or any of them. There is actually a, a marked difference between the reputation of the food industry in Ireland as an industry that embraces technology, embraces growth, embraces innovation and a perception of the food industry in the UK which is not quite as strong as that and I would love to see that gap um, close and there, and there is work going on to do that. But, um, some stats for you, like three million people in the UK work in food. Right? It's the largest industry in the UK if you define it broadly from farm to fork. We are, as, a, as an industry, we're wrestling with some of the most interesting challenges on the planet, all right, around climate change, around sustainability, around nutrition, um, around the, you know, the role of food in health in, in, in lots of different ways. Um, and, and we're playing to very interesting and changing consumer habits all the time. So, you know, so the food industry, as I look at it, it is about technology. You know, we've, we've brought 50 data scientists into GreenCore in the last 15 months, right, to work on supply chain, to work on with our customers on order management, to work on technology in relation to automation in our factories and things like that. We have, um, uh, we also have a lot of, you know, food scientists, we have a lot of marketeers, we've got a lot of accountants and a small number of lawyers. So, so I, I think there is a characterization of food that somehow it's different from technology when in, when in fact, I think in some ways it's the future is all about technology in product and in process. As an industry, I think we, we need to do a, a stronger job in bringing all that to life for all of the stakeholders um, to it, including all the people who eat our products. What would your final piece of advice be to anyone that is in a food company or a technology company and maybe is, is in a similar role to you and they're looking at what is going on in the world right now and they're thinking, am I able for this? Like I'm a big believer in that people are able to do great things. But I would also say I think the food industry needs people in it who want to do great things. The big challenges around feeding a global population, uh, fundamentally changing the carbon and climate change implications of food, food and diet playing a bigger, bigger role in a more proactive approach to health. I mean, they, they require great leaders. I think it's a really interesting space to be and I, I would encourage um, you know, entrepreneurs and um, technologists and talented people generally to join the UK or Irish food industry. Yeah, a lot to do. Indeed. Patrick Coveney, thank you so much.